Aloha. It's a real honor to introduce Richard Heinberg, who agreed to stay an extra day in, in Hawaii to deliver this talk for you. Richard is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute in Santa Rosa, California, and he's widely regarded as one of the world's most effective communicators in the urgent need to get away from fossil fuels. He's best known as a leading educator in peak oil and its impacts. His expertise, publications, and teachings also cover other crucial issues, including the current economic crisis, food and agriculture, community resilience, and global climate change. He's the author of 10 books, including The Party's Over, Oil, War, and the Fate of Industrial Societies, and Peak Everything, Waking Up to the Century of Declines. Tonight he will discuss his latest book, The End of Growth, Adapting to a New Economic Reality. If you aren't familiar with Richard's work, you'll find it a radical departure from what most of us have been taught and what we are been, have been told by the mainstream media. This could be one of the most important events you've ever come to. Fasten your seatbelts and let's welcome Richard Heinberg. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I started uh, this book, The End of Growth, back in September 2008. Uh, you all remember what it was going on in September 2008? Uh, I, I sensed at that time that uh, this was more than a, an economic crisis. Uh, clearly, it was a, a, a pivotal event in our recent history, and since then, uh, several very good books have uh, come out to, to trace the, the, uh, the origin of the, the, the housing bubble and, and how it came apart, how Wall Street uh, uh, created that awful mess. Um, Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail, is certainly uh, an excellent source if you want to read the, the, the story. Um, how many of you have seen Charlie Ferguson's movie, Inside Job? Quite a few. If you haven't yet, by all means, go out and rent it. It's a fabulous uh, recounting of the, the, uh, the ways in which Wall Street has has failed us over recent years. But in, uh, in my book, I have uh, come to somewhat different conclusions, actually. Uh, starting in late 2008, I began having conversations with folks who might have an interesting perspective on, on the financial crisis. I spoke to some Wall Street insiders, the former managing director of J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, vice president of <clears throat> Lehman Brothers, hedge fund managers, but also resource analysts, uh, energy analysts, folks who have been studying for, for decades the, the, uh, the basis of our global energy supply. And they, they, they offered a view of the financial crisis that was uh, broader, more compelling, and fundamentally different from what we've heard up to this point. Uh, <clears throat> in the book, I trace the end of growth, which is what I think we're seeing right now, to what I call the three Ds, debt, depletion, and disaster. Uh, debt we hear about a lot uh, from uh, m many uh, commentators. Depletion is the story of renewable and non-renewable resources and especially the, the energy resources that we depend upon. Uh, 
and disaster, the story of climate change and industrial accidents. I'm going to unpack these three Ds for you this evening and argue that the convergence of these factors is leading us to the most important economic event, not just of our lifetimes, but perhaps of uh, human history. Now let's start at the beginning. How did, how did we get into a growth mode anyway? Uh, it, it, we've, we've gotten used to thinking that economic growth is normal, that it happens all the time, but that's not really the case. Uh, for, for most of our existence as a species, we lived in a kind of steady state economy. It wasn't really growing appreciably from year to year. We were using renewable energy as the basis of our economy and the amount of renewable energy that we could capture was, uh, was relatively the same from one year to the next. Uh, all of this changed just a couple of hundred years ago as we developed the ability to use fossil fuels. Now we've known that fossil fuels existed previously, but we didn't have the basic technology necessary to harness them. All we needed really was metallurgy, uh, some, some gears and, and uh, basic heat engine, steam engine. Once we had those in place, all hell broke loose. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car, having to push your car off to the side of the road. You know that's a lot of work. A car is a heavy thing. Imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. That turns out to be the energy equivalent of maybe 10 or 12 weeks of hard human labor. Okay? We get that done for us from a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying $4 and complaining. Now think about that. 10 or 12 weeks of hard human labor for $4? You can't get labor that cheap in China, India, anywhere in the world. So that's why we've mechanized virtually every process of production and transport that we possibly could over the past century or so. And doing so has yielded enormous economic benefits. As I said earlier, we really didn't see much economic growth in previous centuries. So we get to just the last century and it's off the charts. It's extraordinary the amount of wealth we've created just in the last hundred years or so. At the same time, we were growing human population. Using the concentrated energy of cheap fossil fuels, we were able to create carrying capacity for a rapidly growing human population. So this is GDP per capita, right? Gross domestic product, the total amount of money being spent in the economy. Well, as a result of population increase, there are a lot more capitas too. So multiply this population increase by this per capita growth in wealth and you really begin to see just how much we've been able to accomplish using cheap fossil fuels. So in the early 20th century, this economic miracle manifested as overproduction. Using new production processes, principally the assembly line, we were made able to make stuff in larger quantities and faster than people had ever done before. Faster, in fact, than people were able to absorb and buy all of this stuff. So we, we found two solutions to the problem of overproduction. One solution was advertising, talking people into wanting more stuff than they already had. Uh, I'm using a car ad here because the automobile was really emblematic in this whole process of mass production advertising. And an another strategy related to advertising, which was planned obsolescence. Making stuff that would reliably break down relatively quickly so that people would have to replace it. Or making stuff that 
changed its appearance every year or two or three so that people would want to buy a new one so that they would look up to date. So ad advertising gets more sophisticated just as the automobiles get sleeker and better looking and so on. Well, that, okay, that was one strategy for solving the problem of overproduction. The other strategy was consumer credit, making it easier for people to go into debt to buy big ticket items. You know, at the beginning of the 20th century, 1910, let's say, an automobile cost, what, $950 for a Model T. That doesn't sound like much money today, you know, buying a brand new car for $950, but in 1910, $950 was a lot of money. You could buy a house for that much money. So not many people could afford to pay cash for an automobile. Consumer credit enabled folks to go into debt to buy a car on time. And mass production made it possible for everyone to have a car. Consumer credit made it possible for everyone to buy a car. Debt became the essence of the economy. Prior to the 20th century, there was a close linkage between money and precious metals, gold and silver. Now the problem with metal-based money was as the economy began to grow rapidly, the money supply wasn't growing so rapidly. We weren't finding enormous new quantities of gold and silver. But we had need for more and more money to keep track of all the economic activities that were being made possible by assembly lines and cheap fossil fuels. So what we did over the course of the 20th century was to de-link precious metals from money. Money became debt. If you walk into a bank and borrow $10,000, the banker doesn't go into the vault and look around and, and find you know, $10,000 sitting there that somebody deposited. That's how banking used to work centuries ago. How banking works today is when you take out the loan for $10,000, the banker goes onto a computer and creates that $10,000 out of nothing through a few computer keystrokes. You have called $10,000 into existence magically, and when you pay back that loan, the $10,000 disappears. Now, of course, debt also implies repayment of interest. The interest isn't created at the moment that the loan is made, so how do people pay back their interest on their loans? If all of the money in existence is debt, where does the interest come from? Well, it comes from other people in the economy taking out more loans all of the time. As long as total debt is growing, then if we're, as long as we're doing business with one another, buying and selling stuff, and being employed and so on, chances are enough new money is being created to enable us to pay back the old debt with interest and everything is fine. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme if you think about it. We assume that growth will continue, and that effectively is collateral for today's debt. Okay, so economic growth has become a fundamental feature of the economy. It's not just that we believe that growth is a good thing. We've actually arranged our economy so that it really only works as long as it is growing. So here's a picture of debt in the U.S. economy. Clearly, if GDP is going to grow, we have to have more debt. We have to have more money, which is debt. And that's been happening for decades. Both GDP and debt have been growing. Not just government debt, that's the, the slice at the top, but consumer debt, corporate debt, all the rest. Now, it's actually possible for debt to grow faster than GDP. And we've been doing that too, especially in the economies of the West, but in many, many countries around the world. 
Why, why do that? Why grow GDP? Why grow debt faster than GDP? Well, in order to push consumption forward, so that we can consume more now and pay later. And everybody wants to consume more because we're constantly being talked into it by advertising. Well, in, in fact, there was a kind of turning point in the 1980s with regard to all of this. Because prior to the 1980s, GDP and debt were growing at pretty much the same rate. It was in the 1980s that they began to diverge. What happened in the 1980s? Well, globalization started. What does that have to do with it? Well, what was globalization about? It was very largely about offshoring or outsourcing labor. So American workers were beginning to compete with workers in other countries. Uh, at first, largely Mexico, but then eventually uh, more so China and other countries in Asia. So this is pressing down wages for American workers. Prior to the 1980s, US workers had seen incremental increases in wages, in real terms, when adjusted for inflation year after year. Starting in the 1980s, not so much so. Real wages of American workers basically peaked out around 1973 and haven't gone anywhere since then. So, if wages aren't increasing, but consumption has become 70% of the US economy and people want more stuff because we're constantly being advertised at, how do we make all of this work? Well, with more debt. And so this is the point at which debt starts to grow faster than GDP. Okay? So Americans, American households start going into more and more debt. Uh, mortgage debt, credit card debt, and then this new debt. You see, if, if you take out a, a, a loan, for you, that's an obligation to repay that loan. For the bank, that loan is an asset because they expect not only the repayment of the loan but also interest. So that asset can be bought and sold to other parties. So as American households are taking on more debt for the financial industry, this is an explosion in assets. Right? And so the financial industry is then able to leverage these assets even further. So mortgages get leveraged into mortgage-backed securities. And then derivatives, which are based on these assets, which are basically bets on what's going to happen to the price of assets. Actually, you can write der derivative contracts on almost anything. It's, 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 uh, it's sort of like a, hmm, well, it's, it's a casino, if you will. So, <laughs> so that we have the assets themselves, we have uh, collateralization, and then we have derivatives written on top. So the amount of debt spirals upward to astronomical dimensions. The financial industry is growing as a result of that. It's growing as a percentage of the economy. And therefore, the power of the financial industry is growing. The financial industry begins to lobby Congress to change the financial rules. So, so as to take off restrictions and regulations put in place after the Great Depression to keep the financial industry from over leveraging these debt-based assets. So we get the repeal of the Glass-Steagall law, which had put a firewall between investment banking and commercial banking. So what's happening is Wall Street is becoming, as I said, more powerful, and it's changing the rules. At the same time, by lobbying Washington, it's also in effect, corrupting the political process. In fact, what used to be corruption, buying and selling politicians and, uh, and using Wall Street as a kind of giant casino, these things become perfectly legal. Right? We usually think of corruption as being a few bad actors breaking the rules. Well, 
the rules have been changed. So what might be thought of corruption is now just business as usual. Okay. So this leads to the creation of bubbles, financial bubbles, one after another. We, of course, we have the, the, the dot-com or internet bubble of, of the late 1990s. But the biggest bubble of all was the housing bubble, the, the largest credit bubble, in, not just in US history, but probably in world history. Uh, this is net new debt over the last uh, 15, 17 years, starting 1995. As you can see, most of the new net debt for all of these years was in the mortgage sector. Huge pile of new debt in, in the uh, 2000s. You can see the bubble very clearly. Uh, new government debt is pretty small sector until we get to 2008, suddenly all the net new debt, after you subtract the stuff that's being paid off or defaulted upon, all of the new net debt is from the government. What's going on here? Well, <clears throat> what, what happened, of course, was that when the housing bubble burst, the real estate price bubble, American households lost approximately $6 trillion in net worth. So government steps in and tries to fill the void, tries to keep the economy together by borrowing and spending, the Keynesian stimulus uh, strategy. And so government becomes the borrower and spender of last resort. And that's basically where we still are now. We have two philosophies. Uh, that are out and about these days about how to solve the, the financial and economic crisis. One of them is Keynesian, which says that you know when we have an economic downturn like this, government has to step in and borrow and spend to flip us back into the growth mode. Right? Well, we, we've tried that for the past few years, and what we did is we bought ourselves a short and fairly anemic recovery at the cost of several trillion dollars in terms of not only stimulus packages, but bank bailouts and loan guarantees and so on. But then there are those who look at that and say, well, it hasn't worked, so what we need to do instead is cut back on government borrowing and spending. And if we do that, that will create room for private enterprise to step in, create jobs, and get the economy growing again. There's no evidence that that is going to happen. In fact, where we're seeing austerity programs applied, as in Greece, the economy is shrinking even faster. So what's going on here? Could it be that we've hit fundamental limits to growth? Well, we were warned all the way back in 1972. This, this is a book I read as a 21-year-old kid back in 1972. It changed my life. In, in fact, really all my adult life has been shaped by the information contained in this book. It was extraordinary. It was the first attempt to use computers to model the interaction between population growth, resource depletion, and environmental impacts from industrial accidents. Uh, what this team of scientists did was basically program a computer with all of this data. And of course, the, the software available at that time was very primitive. The computer itself was very primitive by today's standards. And the data were, you know, quite preliminary. We have much more robust data, much better computers and software today. But this, for 1972, this was the state of the art. And no matter how they massaged the data and the software, they kept coming up with a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. So they, they doubled the world's resources in their, in their input data. They, uh, they tried to model what would happen if governments created policies to rein in population growth and pollution. 
And they were able, doing these things, to push out the industrial collapse by a decade or two or three. But it still happened. Now, it's actually kind of intuitively obvious that something like this might be possible because, after all, if our industrial growth of the past few decades has been based largely on the cheap, concentrated energy of fossil fuels, well, we know that fossil fuels are finite. These things aren't going to, aren't going to last forever. So whether the base of this the sine wave is is you know broader or narrower. Whether we you know a world reserves of oil and coal are you know four or five times what we currently think they are or less. From a big historic perspective, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, it, it matters to us personally whether you know what the conditions of the remainder of our lives will be. But you know, to historians a thousand years from now. This is what the fossil fuel era is going to look like, one way or the other. So does that mean that civilization is going to follow the same trajectory? Well, maybe, I don't know. Is, is this something that we should worry about right now? Or is it going to take care of itself? Will we find alternative sources of energy that will enable us to just keep, keep growing even as fossil fuels deplete? Well, as I studied these issues over the past several years, it's, it's become pretty clear that this is an issue that we need to worry about right now. The U.S. is where this whole industrial paradigm really took off. You know, when we talk about the automobile industry as we were doing earlier and the consumer credit industry and so on, advertising, that's what, the U.S. is where all these things happen because the U.S. was fossil fuel ground zero for decades. This is where the oil industry started. During the early 20th century, we were not only the, the world's foremost oil producing nation, we were the world's foremost oil exporting nation. We were producing half the world's oil in any typical year. So it was disturbing to a number of observers to see when oil discoveries in the U.S. started declining after 1930. And then oil production in the U.S. started declining after 1970. We became the world's foremost oil importing nation. Now what's happening is we're seeing the same pattern in country after country around the world. Former oil exporters are become, but becoming oil importers. And world oil discoveries have been declining since 1964. Now, we're not running out of oil in the sense that, you know, five years from now there will be no oil left. No, we're still finding oil. But the thing is, we're finding oil in smaller pockets, generally speaking, and we're starting to count as oil stuff that is of such low quality that even though we've known it, it, it exists for decades, we never counted it before because we thought, well, why even bother with that stuff if we got light, sweet crude? This is actual U.S., or not, excuse me, it's, this is actual world crude oil production over the past few years. What's happened is since about 2004, 2005, we've been on a plateau, a kind of bumpy plateau. Even though prices of oil have been generally increasing to record levels, and even though demand for oil is growing, especially in Asia, where the Chinese are buying millions of new cars every year, China, the Chinese people are buying more new cars now than Americans are. First time in history that's ever happened in another country has surpassed the U.S. in terms of automobile purchases. Even though all of those things are happening, actual production has been flatlined, basically. This suggests that we're starting to hit fundamental limits. Even though we're bringing online all this low-grade stuff like the Canadian tar sands, the, the uh, uh, shale oil in North Dakota that has to be produced by hydrofracking, uh, heavy oil in, in Venezuela, and so on. Even though we're bringing in all of this low-grade stuff, it's not making much of a difference in actual world output. You know, this is what the oil industry looked like 
back in the 1930s. This is what it looks like today, where so much of what's being produced is from deep water offshore, drilling in a mile or two or three of ocean water before we even get to rock, and then another mile uh, or two of rock before you get to the, the pocket of oil. This is a slide from the U.S. Department of Energy, the Energy Information Administration. Uh, all of those nice colored bands represent all of the oil in the world that we know about. OPEC oil, non-OPEC oil, conventional oil, unconventional oil. And as you can see, right about now, all of that starts dropping off. The big, old, supergiant oil fields that were discovered in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, those are depleting and declining in production. And new production from all of these smaller and more marginal and offshore and uh, tar sand sources are simply not enough to make up for that. But not to worry, says the U.S. Department of Energy, because we will get enough new oil to make up for rising demand from unidentified projects. Now, undoubtedly, unidentified projects will appear. But at what rate? In what number? We don't know because they're unidentified. We have a faith-based energy policy in this country. <laughs> our primary energy source. It's virtually all of our transport energy, and yet we don't have a plan B. We're riding on a prayer, a wing and a prayer. Again, what's actually happening is that the cost of developing these new marginal sources is increasing at a dramatic pace. Back in the year 2000, you, it was possible for the industry to develop new production capacity for the investment of about $20 a barrel. It's now up in the range of, I say $80 here, but according to the latest information that I've, I've just heard in the last couple of weeks, it's more on the order of an average of about $87 a barrel. In other words, the industry needs oil prices at that level in order to, adjust it, in order to justify investment in these new marginal sources. It can cost up to $500 million to drill one exploratory well in deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and it may come up dry. That's the level of investment we're talking about, okay? So meanwhile, we know now from experience that every time the price of oil shoots up to above $100 a barrel in inflation-adjusted terms, the economy, the U.S. economy, starts to go into convulsions. Look at this. The, the vertical gray bars are recessions over the past 30, 40 years, right? And the squiggly red line on top of that is oil prices adjusted for inflation. This is $2,008, okay? Every time we've had a, an oil price spike, we've had a recession immediately follow. Now, we, we have had a, a recession or two that does not appear to be correlated with an oil price spike. So it's not true to say that oil price spikes are the only things that cause recessions. However, we don't have any instances where we've had an oil price spike without a recession immediately following. So that suggests that there's a close relationship between oil prices and recessions. Now, let's go back to this slide. It's true that if oil prices rise slowly enough, we can adapt, the economy can adapt to higher oil prices, and that does appear to be happening in the U.S. But it's not happening fast enough because this the cost of developing new oil supplies is rising so much faster. Remember, I, I mentioned a minute ago that in the year 2000, it was only about $20 a barrel. Now it's up to $87 a barrel. Within a couple of years, it will be over $100 a barrel. So that means that if for some reason the oil price drops, maybe we go back into a serious recession like happened in 2008 and the oil, oil price collapsed. That's what happened at the end of 2008, once after 
uh, Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt and the whole economy went into you know this horrible uh, situation. What happened was that killed demand for oil in the U.S. People stopped driving. Okay, well, of course, a lot of people lost their jobs, so they weren't driving to work anymore. So the price of oil collapsed down to about thirty-six dollars a barrel temporarily. It's it's recovered most of that back up to over a hundred dollars a barrel today. So, <clears throat> if that happens then that's not high, a high enough price for the industry to justify more exploration, so the industry cuts back on exploration, so that means that later on supplies start dropping, which pushes the price back. We're in this situation where every time the economy starts to recover, that pushes up oil prices to the point where it caps economic recovery. The, the economy starts to decline again and that allows oil prices then to drop a little bit so then the economy can recover a little bit but then oil prices go back effectively oil prices are now a cap on US economic growth the situation is slightly different in China and some other Asian countries they are still able to tolerate somewhat higher oil prices in the range of let's say 120 to 130 dollars a barrel on a sustained basis. So what's happening is that oil demand is shifting away from the US and European countries to China. China's oil demand is growing while oil demand in the US and Europe is stagnant and in some years actually declining. Well again this is very serious business, especially for a state like Hawaii, which is so dependent on oil for transportation, for tourism, for the importation of food, for electricity. This state generates something like 90% of its electricity from oil. So while the U.S. as a whole is extraordinarily vulnerable to high oil prices and price shocks and, and supply shocks. Hawaii is especially so. Food. We've created a food system in this country and globally that's overwhelmingly dependent on oil for, for transporting inputs to the farm, inputs in the form of uh, seeds, fertilizers, fuels, lubricants, all the rest, for transporting outputs from the farm, in other words, food itself, all the way to the consumer plate. Now, for the U.S. as a whole, the average food mile, food mileage is about 1,500 miles from farm to plate. What is it for Hawaii? Probably something closer to 2,500 miles. So what's happened with this fuel-dependent food system is that food prices have started moving in lockstep with oil prices, globally speaking. In fact, food prices are actually rising faster than oil prices because oil is not the only driver of high food prices. Another driver is weird weather, floods, fires, and droughts, destroying crops. So that, in turn, is impacting the stability of governments around the world, where we see uh, nations, poor nations with quickly rising populations, typically uh, very young populations, not many jobs, where people have to spend a very large proportion of their in income on food and fuel, when suddenly food and fuel prices shoot up, these folks who maybe may have tolerated authoritarian autocratic regimes for decades, suddenly these people have nothing to lose. And they pour out into the streets, they topple governments. Totally understandable. Well, I've been talking about oil a lot. <clears throat> oil is not the only non-renewable resource that is required for economic growth. This is just a short list 
of mineral resources, non-renewable resources that happen to be useful in the computer industry and the renewable energy industry. They're all getting more scarce and expensive. Well, why aren't we hearing about this? Um, <clears throat> well, what's, what's been happening is up until about the year 2000, most of these materials were actually getting cheaper and, of course, economists looked at this and they said, well, it's the magic of the market. Well, that's part of it. What was actually happening is we were using more and more cheap energy, and mostly in the form of oil, to dig deeper, extract lower grade ores, refine those ores, again using more cheap energy, and then globalize the whole process of resource exploration and extraction. So copper was getting cheaper, even as we depleted the higher grade ores, the stuff was getting cheaper. Since the year 2000, most of these mineral uh, commodities have been getting more expensive. So there are signs of scarcity. <clears throat> now, okay, if, if depletion of energy resources, especially oil, is such a problem, well, why don't we just go out there and develop alternative energy sources? No problem, right? Uh, well, yes, we do need to do that, but it is still a problem. We did a, a study uh, at Post Carbon Institute a couple of years ago. And by the way, you can download all of our stuff free from our website, postcarbon.org. This is about a 75-page 75, 75 study. We looked at 18 different energy sources, and we examined them across 10 criteria. Criteria like the energy that you get back for the energy that you invest in producing energy. That's really important. You know, if it costs you as much energy to produce a unit of energy as, as you get out of, the, out of the process, why bother? You know, so we looked at the environmental impacts, the location of, of the energy source, the, the scalability, and, and so on we weren't able to identify a likely scenario in which world energy supplies are likely to grow as fossil fuels become more scarce and expensive. Certainly there are uh, alternative energy sources that are viable and that can be developed to a much greater degree, but we can't expect the total amount of energy available to society to increase as we make this transition. Moreover, many of the alternative energy sources have fundamental characteristics different from fossil fuels. With fossil fuels, you just you know burn the stuff at whatever rate, whenever you need it. Whereas some of the alternative energy sources like solar and wind are intermittent. The sun isn't shining all the time, the wind isn't blowing all the time, so you have to make allowance for that. You have to have energy storage capacity or you have to, you have to rebuild the grid in, in ways that will balance loads and, and so on. Well, I've talked a lot about debt and depletion. What about the third D, disaster? Well. As I mentioned earlier, that has a lot to do with weird weather, with climate change. Also has a lot to do with industrial accidents. This is a, an amazing photo of, of the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe of 2010. What's happening is, the, is that the cost of these disasters is growing. Why should that be? We've always had disasters. We've always had nasty weather events and, and accidents and earthquakes and, and so on. Well, a couple of things are happening. First of all, we're seeing uh, increasing impacts from climate change, which we've never had before. Then the scale of our industrial processes is increasing. We're having to go to the ends of the earth to produce oil, for example. So when something goes wrong in a couple of miles of ocean water, suddenly this is a big deal. You know, we've had oil spills for, for decades, but now when something happens, it's, it's really a catastrophe. So altogether, the costs are mounting rapidly. In 2010, the cost of Deepwater Horizon, the, uh, the, the, the drought in Russia, the flood in Pakistan, amounted to something like $250 billion direct cost to society. This year, 2011, we passed the $250 billion mark by June. 
So this is almost an exponential increase in cost of natural disasters. You start extrapolating that out a few years, the likely cost from climate change and these other things, and economic growth disappears quite quickly. And that's, that's what's happening. The, the other impact from disasters, of course, is to the insurance industry. We no, no, no longer know how to value risk because we don't know what the risk is going to be. What, we, what it used to be, 100 year floods or droughts are now occurring on a five or 10 year basis. So altogether, this is, this is the track we've been on. We've been on, on kind of a runaway train, right? But it's felt so good. We've been accelerating and accelerating as we grow. Been using more stuff, tossing more and more fuel into the, into the boiler. And as we go faster, it's exhilarating. More jobs, higher returns on investment. You know, the smokestack of the train is belching out all kinds of pollution, but you know, we don't really notice because it's, it's billowing out behind us as we speed up. And it, it, everybody wants the train to succeed. Everybody wants it to grow and grow faster. And meanwhile, <laughs> we face real environmental limits. We live on a planet of a certain size. You can't keep growing something on a finite planet forever. I mean, this has real consequences. Think about it this way. Uh, let's, let's take a kind of a funny example. A uh, hamster, newborn hamster, weighs hardly anything. But when a hamster is born, it, it's growing rapidly. It's doubling its weight every week. Okay. So what happened if our hypothetical hamster could continue doubling its weight every week for a whole year? How big a, a hamster would we have? Well, somebody's actually done the math. It turns out we would have a nine billion ton hamster at the end of just one year. That's the magic of compound growth, right? Every time you see that something is growing at a certain percentage per year, that means it has a certain doubling time. There's the law of 70. If something is growing at 10% per year, that means it's doubling every seven years. What's happening to China's economy right now? It's growing at 10% per year. That means it's doubling in size every 10 years. So after 10 years, it's twice as big. After 20 years, it's four times as big. After Excuse me, should, I should be going in seven year increments. After seven years, it's twice as big. After 14 years, it's four times as big. After 20 years, it's eight times as big. Imagine that. Is that going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. Something that can't go on forever doesn't. And the track that we've been on for the past few decades is something that can't go on forever. I would submit to you that we are reaching those fundamental limits to growth now, in real time. This is the story of our lifetimes. We are being told by policymakers, politicians, economists, that we're just in a little depression here, a little recession, and we'll get back to normal growth and everything will be fine. I don't think that's what, what's in the cards. Now, some, some economists are talking about this as a growth crisis, right? The problem we have is that we're not seeing adequate levels of economic growth. And so the debt levels that have been racked up by countries like Greece and Italy and France and the United States, well, you know, we took on all that debt when growth rates were higher. And now, because the economy isn't growing so fast, that means the tax revenues are declining. So that makes those debt levels harder to repay, and suddenly we have problems with levels of government debt. 
And this is a, a graphic by an economist named Charles Hugh Smith, and he's just showing all of the dominoes lined up. Well, this is, these are just the dominoes in Greece. The dominoes extend from Athens to Rome to Wall Street to Washington to Beijing. This is what we will be seeing unfold over the course of the next few months and few years. It's inevitable. The debt can't be repaid. One way or another, we will be seeing massive defaults. That's what's being talked about in the case of Greece right now, a 50% haircut. In other words, those to whom Greece owes the hundreds of billions in, in debt, government debt that it's taken on, they'll have to accept 50% less in, in repayment. Well, that may end up being more than 50% actually down the road, and the same thing could happen with Italy, which owes 2.6 trillion. So a 50% haircut there means, you know, one point some uh, trillion that banks in France and elsewhere will have to write off. Meanwhile, Wall Street investment banks like Goldman Sachs have written trillions in derivative contracts on the basis of that debt. The whole thing is going to unwind. It's unstoppable. It doesn't matter who bail out, bails out whom. So this is our economic future, folks. And when I, when I talk to the, the people that, that I spoke to in researching this book, the couple of two or three dozen people who, who were you know, former insiders on Wall Street, policymakers, and so on, I didn't talk to a single person who saw things differently from this. Doesn't look very happy, does it? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, the story doesn't stop there, but I, you know, I have to drive the point home. You know, I think it's really important that we get what is, what is happening to our communities. You know, we have a whole political party in this country that's saying, you know, bring on austerity. We have to cut back on government spending. Well, it's true. Government debt really is a problem. We have racked up debt that government is not going to be able to repay. But what does austerity really look like? Are we really ready for this? Is this what we want? Now, what, what's the solution? I, you know, I, there is no easy solution. But we should be aware of what we're getting ourselves into. Uh, there are folks now out on the streets in cities around the country, city after city. And I visited a number of the uh, Occupy encampments in, you know, in Portland and Santa Rosa and Washington, D.C. and here in, in Honolulu. And, you know, people are not being driven so much by uh, political um, ideology. You know, they're not coming out in the streets because they've got this whole set of demands worked out and, and, and so People are coming out in the streets to a large measure out of desperation. They know that something is terribly wrong in our political system and our financial system. They know that the, the bankers are being bailed out, but that household income is declining. And what, what do we do about this? They know that they're being lied to. So it's perfectly understandable that this is happening, and I think it's a good thing, quite frankly. I think we need something outside of our political system to shake things up. If, in fact, we have, as I asserted earlier, a political system and a financial system that are fundamentally corrupted, that can't be changed from within the system, we need a force from outside the system to shake things up. Well, I, I mentioned earlier about Hawaii's economy, the fact that the state gets so much of its electrical power uh, from oil, its food system is dependent on imports and so on. I would suggest that this set of islands has probably the biggest challenge of any place I've visited in recent times. It also has enormous opportunity. I mean, Hawaii could easily get all of its electricity from renewable energy. 
Hawaii could grow all of its food. Topsoil, weather, the opportunity is here, but where's the policy? Where's the leadership? Some, some fundamental things are going to have to change here in the rest of the country and around the world. I think one of the, one of the things that has to be done at the higher levels of government is get off of GDP altogether. If we're in a situation, as I believe we are, where we're not going to be able to continue growing GDP, we have to have other measures and indicators. We have to have other targets to aim for as a society. You know, what we've done over the past decade, because we were able to grow the economy so fast, is we started paying attention to that and stopped paying attention to all the other things that are worthwhile in life. You know, we don't, we don't care so much anymore about the quality of our community, about the, the quality of our culture. These are just little ornaments, right? If, if those things are doing okay, well, that's nice, but that's not what's important. What's important is GDP growth, right? Well, you know, politicians are promising growth. They're not going to be able to deliver. Those promises are hollow. What they should be doing, if they're smart, is beginning to promise better quality of life and figuring out how to deliver on those promises because we can have better quality of life even as we consume less and, and spend less money. There are a lot of things. If, if we're at the point of peak in world global oil supplies, which I think we probably are, we're not at the point of peak in terms of quality of life, at least not potentially so. There are a lot of things we traded away for GDP growth. And in fact, there are whole countries that are starting to experiment with alternative indicators. GDP has been recognized for decades as a perverse indicator. There are all kinds of things that make GDP go up that don't improve our quality of life. War can make GDP go up as we saw during the Second World War. Now, did, that, did, did the Second World War make everybody happier? 50 million people died to improve the economy. Well, that, that wasn't the purpose of the conflict, granted. But we do all sorts of perverse things to make GDP increase that don't make life better. Uh, the tiny nation of Bhutan, the kingdom of Bhutan, since 1972 has been experimenting with what they call gross national happiness. Now Bhutan does not have particularly high GDP per capita. In fact, it's in, in the lower third of nations, lowest third of nations in the world. Nevertheless, when people in Bhutan are polled about their satisfaction with how they're doing in life and, and so on, they poll as being some of the happiest people in the world. Why? Well, partly because they've remained self-sufficient and they still retain much of their traditional culture, but also because that's what they're aiming for. That's what they measure. That's their target. That's their goal is quality of life and happiness as opposed to making and spending more money. We need to build local resilience. Resilience is the ability to absorb shocks and keep functioning. My friends, we have shocks in store, serious economic shocks. So how do we keep functioning in view of those? Well, we have to, we have to localize a lot of things that have become globalized. Why so? Well, resilience is very often the opposite of economic efficiency. Now, economic efficiency is different from energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is almost always a good thing. Economic efficiency, not always so. You know, if you can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than any place else, economic efficiency says grow all your corn in Iowa and don't grow anything in Iowa except corn. Okay, that's economically sensible. But if you do that, then what happens if the corn crop in Iowa fails? Then nobody has corn anywhere. It's not a resilient system. It's a, it's a brittle system that 
puts everyone at risk. Well, that's what we've done with globalization, with just-in-time delivery, with reducing inventories. We've created a system that's economically efficient, that's produced more GDP growth, but it's put the entire world at risk. We saw this uh, with the, uh, uh, the Fukushima disaster in Japan. When factories in Japan shut down, suddenly spare parts weren't available for car factories here in the US. We have a, a global system that's become so integrated that if something goes wrong in one place, it can affect the ent entire system. So what we need is more redundancy, more local food production, more food producers. We need to train millions of young people how to be ecological farmers. And we need to provide them with the opportunity to farm. Rather than paving over far the best farmland on Oahu and build 1,200 new housing units, young farmers and making farmland available to them. Okay, that's a resilient food system. It's food systems, transport systems, uh, health and medical systems. Across, we have to be rethinking basically our entire industrial paradigm. As we do that, we also have to be thinking about economics as a discipline. You know, economics grew up during this anomalous period of cheap fossil fuels. And economists, I think, took credit for, in, in, in the name of the market, for a lot of what happened just as a result of having cheap, abundant fossil fuels. Economists got the idea that somehow the entire natural world was just a subset of the economy. You know, it was just a pile of resources that we extract and turn into consumer products that ultimately become waste. Right? Well, of course, it's, it's the other way around. The human economy is a subset of the environment. Always has been, always will be. If the ecosystem fails, the human economy fails. That's just one idea that I think is important to get embedded in basic economic theory. Growth in population and consumption is not fundamentally sustainable. You can grow population and you can grow consumption for a while, but you can't do it forever. Remember doubling times? Remember the hamster? At some point, you run into trouble. So what we have to aim for is not a constantly growing economy, but an economy of sufficiency and one that exists within the boundaries of what nature can sustainably provide for us. Well, what can nature sustainably provide? Well, there are a couple of rules that tell us. Renewable resources have to be harvested at less than the rate of natural replenishment. Duh. Any 10-year-old can understand this. A PhD economist, maybe it takes a little bit longer. But it's intuitively clear. And non-renewable resources, well, there's only so much there. So we have to conserve non-renewable resources as much as possible. Recycle them wherever possible. And make sure that the rate at which we extract them is declining. Okay, very simple rules. No, question is, can we follow those simple rules and still build one of these? I don't know. We're certainly not following those rules right now. Uh, there are all sorts of rare and depleting minerals that go into producing one of these smartphones. Uh, also, economic arrangements, you know, these are made by people mostly in China in, in working conditions that are abhorrent and they're being paid, you know, three or four or five dollars a day. Is this a sustainable situation? Absolutely not. And when I say it's not sustainable, I don't mean it's not eco-groovy. I mean it can't go on forever and probably not for very much longer. So if we really think these are the coolest things in the world, 
the greatest things that any human being has ever invented, and we want to spend hours every day staring into those little screens, we'd better figure out a different way of building them. <clears throat> I would suggest that every community around the country and around the world should start looking into making a community economic laboratory. You can call it something else if you want. And there are a number of communities that actually already have started to put together one of these you know, practical research institutes. Every community has some kind of alternative economic project going on, whether it's a ride share, car share, or a, a credit union you know, job center, whatever. Right now, these are, are fringe. Right. This is this is what maybe exists for the, the the homeless or jobless or for the hippies or for you know people who can't afford to own their own car or whatever. Okay, we need to bring all these things together and make them clearly available and apparent to the broader community because as our existing economic paradigm fails, this is what we're going to have to fall back upon. This has got to be mainstreamed. There are uh, very useful uh, models being explored all around the country and all around the world. And one of the, one of the most interesting that I've seen is the transition towns. How many people here are associated with, a, with Transition Oahu or another transition group? A number. If, you, if you're interested in this, notice who has their hand up and maybe talk to them afterward. The whole thing started in, uh, in Britain back in oh, 2006 or so uh, with a, a brilliant young uh, permaculture teacher, ecological agriculture, named Rob Hopkins. And uh, <clears throat> He realized that we needed, this was a you know, profoundly important transition in society that was needed away from fossil fuels, but he was skeptical that governments were going to be able to lead that transition, and I think, I think his skepticism was maybe well grounded. So what he, he, he did was put together some kind of basic ideas and principles and suggestions in, in this book, The Transition Handbook, and it went viral. Uh, there are something like 400 communities around the world now that have recognized transition towns or transition initiatives going on. Uh, over a hundred here in the United States. And it's, it's not based on you know, getting the government to do something. It ends up looking more like a, like a fiesta, like a party than a, than a protest march. Because you've got people who are already doing things around local food and local transportation and so on, and getting them together and share their ideas and, and have a great unleashing where suddenly the whole town, the whole community uh, is, is invited in to see what the possibilities and prospects are for, for turning that town into a model community. Okay, so that's, that's pretty exciting. If you get involved in a transition town, it can, it, it can be like any group, you know, a, a, a bunch of people sitting around thinking about what, what they can do, uh, looking at their calendars, figuring out, and you can get involved in, in kind of the, the minutia of change, and that's important. But it's, it's also important to keep in mind the big picture. What we're involved in is one of history's great Transitions. Let me explain this to you for a second. We've been through this before. We started with fire, probably several million years ago, maybe three or four million years ago. Everything changed when we human beings developed the ability to control fire. We, we gained the ability to cook our food. That actually changed us physiologically. Uh, before and after, look at the dentition of the, of the skeletons of ancient humans. Uh, we, we learn how to change our environment by burning off the, the undergrowth and brush that, that uh, kept us from being able to, to migrate easily. And in the, in the place of the brush would grow grasses that would, would be the food for you know, deer and rabbits and animals that, that we, could, we could hunt. So fire was a, was a very huge deal in human history. 
Then language, we don't exactly know when language emerged, best guess, several tens of thousands of years ago. What did language do for us? Well, just think about it. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here right now if it weren't for language. But uh, put yourself in the shoes of, or the non-shoes of a, of a Paleolithic human, uh, maybe wanting to hunt for a mastodon. Probably not in Hawaii, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, how, how would you do that without language? You know, okay, I'm going to hide behind this bush over here with this spear. You go over there and get the attention of the mastodon, and then I'll throw the spear. You know, that's the only way you could do it. So with, with language, we gained the ability to coordinate our behavior over space and time. Agriculture roughly 10,000 years ago, gave us the ability to control our food supply in ways that we couldn't previously. We could produce seasonal surpluses of grains and store those seasonal surpluses. It enabled us to have full-time division of labor. For the first time, we had uh, peasants and kings and soldiers and artisans. Cities grew out of agriculture, mathematics, Civilization itself. Think of the enormous change in human society that, that that brought about. Then the Industrial Revolution. Our our population grew from under one billion to seven billion. The the power of fossil fuels and and the the control of our over our environment that that gave us. Well, that whole trajectory has brought us to a certain point in our development as a species. What comes next? I don't know. We, maybe it's the sustainability revolution, but I don't think the word sustainability is quite adequate for, for this enormous transition. Maybe we could think of it as finally growing up as humans, of understanding once and for all that we have to live within ecological limits and boundaries. Now some of our ancient an ancestors actually did understand that because they, they had to live within those limits whether they liked it or not. But fossil fuels enabled us to forget about environmental limits to a very large degree. The sky is the limit, we thought. We were putting people on the moon. Okay, well that is now shifting. And it's time for us to finally become a mature species on this planet. Okay? Well, isn't that something worth devoting your life to? So, um, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to share these thoughts with you, and I hope we have still a few minutes left for questions and discussion. It's an amazing time to be alive. Thank you very much.